So, ladies and gentlemen, I had mentioned that uh, I was particularly pleased that I had two personal heroes as keynote speakers, and it gives me enormous pleasure to invite uh, our second keynote speaker. And although I have not had the pleasure of working with Senator Javed Jabbar, I have followed both him, his career, uh, distinguished career, since my college days. So, Javed Jabbar is one of the most distinguished intellectuals of Pakistan, a politician who is a strong public advocate and an environmentalist. He's a former senator and has served in three federal cabinets as Minister for Information and Broadcasting, Science and Technology, Petroleum and Natural Resources, and has served as an advisor to the Chief Executive of Pakistan on National Affairs. He's, he's authored many books, but more notably, he's produced some landmark documentaries and movies dating back to a landmark documentary on Moindadaro. And if anybody has not seen it, please do. It's, um, I think it's titled Moindadaro, a city that must not die. Um, you know, Senator Jabbar devotes substantial working time to voluntary work for several public service organizations. He's presently the chairman and co-founder with Dr. Fees Pasha of the Social Policy and Development Center, SPDC, that we hope, Senator Sahab, that we might be able to collaborate with. And it's one of Asia's most reputed think tanks. He was a uh, global vice president of IUCN uh, for eight years, 2004 to 12, which, as many people know, is the world's largest and oldest uh, environmental organization with over 130 countries. I could go on and on. But let me not take away his time and invite him to the podium to give us his thoughts. Thank you, Senator Sahab. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Prince Rahim Aga Khan. Mr. Zakir Mahmood, Dr. Karl Anheim, Mr. Suleiman Shahabuddin, Dr. Zulfikhar Bhutta, who made the mistake of inviting me, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Professor Je Jeffrey Sachs, who has just given a scintillating exposition. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for giving me the honor of coming back to Aga Khan University. What an institution. Amongst other things, it has such a comfortable auditorium. My God. I mean, it's too comfortable for this subject. May I dare to suggest that we should have had this conference in uh, Tharparkar or in the nice, warm heat uh, receding, of course, evenings in Karachi are so pleasant. Out somewhere in Malir or Landhi, uh, with that noise and the traffic in the background instead of music. Uh, but this is a very, you know, it, it seduces one and it spoils one. Anyone who works for Aga Khan uh, University is thoroughly spoilt. Uh, provost, please watch out for them. Huh? Don't let them get used to this luxury. But this is all luxury for a good cause. Uh, education, the pursuit of knowledge, the service of human beings. What nobler causes can those be? And you deserve this comfort. But be conscious of the privilege that you are enjoying. And I'm not trying to be hoity-toity or be superior. I cannot but forget that we are in a country where, just as Aga Khan University continues its search for excellence after having achieved excellence already, there are 20 million children out of school. Forget going to a university. I mean, this kind of environment. 20 million children? My God. It's like a Crime against humanity. You know, we are talking about war crimes these days, but this is peace crimes. You can have peace, uh, no conflict, no wars, but what a crime we are all witness to, uh, we are part of. I don't want to start off by 
making you feel guilty. You're not guilty. But we need to remain conscious of how privileged we are to be able to access these premises and to have an environment in which we can conduct dialogue and listen to each other. I think we've been benefited by each of the preceding speakers, each of them, Dr. Zulfiqar Bhutta, who introduced the concept and who I wish uh, success for the very brave and path-breaking initiatives that you're taking. Uh, Prince Rahim Al Khan, it's been a, a privilege for me to listen to him for the first time and how, uh, how beneficial this is for this institution to have a gentleman of his vision and his uh, insight. And then the Provost Sahab, wow. Ek to Urdu bhi seekh rahe na. he is uh, Dr. Bhutta. I hope Urdu is made compulsory for all Provosts. <laughs> but uh, he, he, the two analogies he gave were so apt, uh, from one from uh, the global perspective and one from our Khan University's experience itself. And then how nice to know that you bring the wealth of experience from East Africa uh, to Pakistan. I wish you success. And Professor Jeffrey Sachs has uh, very insightfully and so courageously and so refreshingly been self-critical about his own country. If a Pakistani addressed an international conference and was anywhere remotely as scathing as he has been about his own country's government, my God, he would be suspected of lack of patriotism. Being a foreign agent, huh? <laughs> weakening his own country. But one of the great merits of America is, it has many demerits, but one of the great merits is that it encourages very candid, free discussion and self-scrutiny. Not most, uh, most of them don't do it, but there are outstanding individuals and thinkers like Professor Jeffrey Sachs who does it so well. So my task is to, uh, is to deprive you of the lingering wisdom of Professor Jeffrey Sachs and to distract you with my own unprecious thoughts. And how do I go about changing the slide? Yes, there we are. Yes, just that. Thank you. That's a very formidable title for this seminar, Dr. Bhutta. <laughs> Strategies for change. Huh? Well, I'd like to begin by saying, let's look at calamities. Uh, and I'm, I love language. I love the alliteration. Uh, climate change, climate change. Of course, we're all very worried about it. But I said, uh, what about looking at the other aspects of uh, change? Change as a phenomenon because change should be for the better. And inevitably, if you look at the whole record of humanity, going back, whether it's 200,000 years or 10,000 years when we discovered agriculture, uh, change has been for the better. In most respects, it's been for the better. But change is also a process of calamities. And a calamity can be a single uh, terrible event or as we like to discover sometimes, it can be a long and excruciating process, a continuous calamity. And we all get used to living with it. And not just we in Pakistan. A calamity can be, as hopefully we shall see, uh, international as well. So calamities have been global, they are regional, depending on who your neighbors are. And we have such a nice small neighbor to the east who makes sure that conditions always are peaceful and we have nothing to worry about. So calamities can be, and you can't choose your neighbors. Huh? You're stuck with your neighbors, like your families. You can't choose your families. And no disrespect to parents. Better not be because I'm a parent. My children dare not say that they're stuck with their parents and their father. Huh. Just for the record, in case we forget, climate change can be a very 
obscure kind of term. So let's just remember air, the air we breathe. And we are privileged to have Lahore as such a beautifully polluted city of South Asia, the most polluted city of the region. Water, water, wow, wow, wow. Kya zamana tha when one could drink water from the tap, when one could uh, dip a glass into a stream. Huh? Now it's plastic, plastic water. Unless you get it in a bottle, you can't be sure the water you're drinking. Water. And one of the fastest reducing water availabilities per capita. Land. As Professor Jeffrey Sachs said, land use. Encroaching cities, expanding livelihoods. Yeah? And this one word which I love, biodiversity. It doesn't figure in the 17 SDGs. Of course, it's assumed to be part of the environment and part of climate change, but it bears reflection briefly. What is biodiversity? About 12, 12 years ago, at a conference in uh, South America, in Ecuador, a British participant, a colleague of mine said, do you know there is a survey we conducted in the United Kingdom and we asked people, what do you understand by the term biodiversity? And she said what disturbed one was. About 55% said, yeah, isn't that the name for a new detergent? <laughs> biodiversity. Biodiversity. My God, it's the very fabric of nature. And without making this into a commercial, let me say humbly that we in an organization called Ba Beli, where we began work in Tharparkar 37 years ago, four years ago, we are helping just a little with biodiversity. Because guess what? 12 to 15 years ago, South Asia discovered a rapid drastic reduction in the population of vultures. Who cares about vultures? They eat dead flesh. Vultures, so repugnant, their very function in nature. But vultures are an essential part of the fabric of nature. And why did they start disappearing? Because a drug called Declofenac, administered to livestock, had elements that helped to collapse the internal digestive systems of vultures across South Asia. And as a result, contamination of the soil, contamination of water, an increase in feral dogs, a spread of local diseases, vultures, vultures prevented all those things from happening. And when we started work four years ago, the population we marked, one of the few pockets left in the whole country, uh, Changamanga and Nagar Parkar in Thar Parkar. We had, we had about 359 vultures were counted. Today, I am humbly proud to say the population has increased to 650. And considering that a vulture gives an egg only once a year, and if a predator grabs it, it's gone. Balance, which is another word you don't find in the SDGs, but it is implicit, it's explicit. We've disturbed the holy, sacred balance of nature. So well articulated in Surah Al-Rahman also. But it's not particular to Islam. Balance is a universal virtue. So, just to refresh our memory. 17 goals, huh? but oh, 232 indicators, ah, that's formidable, and 169 development targets, and all of us have subscribed to it, the whole committee of nations. It is unfair, but we've got it, and there is an understanding that everyone is not going to be able to achieve, because if you break this down further, my God, you get into a real thicket. 
To be fair to Pakistan, back in 2016, a unanimous resolution. Imagine, I mean, us noble uh, people who are politicians, the noblest species of them all. We managed to actually have unanimity on adopting this as a national agenda and committed ourselves to 2030. Ah, oh, so what do I mean by calamities of change? Let's take connectivity. 220 million, 230 million people, 175 million cell phones. Yes, many of them are not in the internet. But so many have never ever connected with each other for the first time. And even if it is for chatter, or gossip, or frivolity, what a marvelous spectacle of connectivity in remote villages and slums, in the rich slums of DHA and Clifton, and in the poor slums, there's equity for the first time. Everyone's got a cell phone, and often they have two. And yet, side by side with that, huh, a total lack of connectivity when it comes to collecting data. <laughs> if you take the social indicators for SDGs, for only 33 we have the data. I mean, we need 81 indicators supplied with data. And one would have thought with connectivity, even if you're not using the internet. Just as there have been examples already of uh, the cell phones being vitally uh, necessary and functionally effective in collecting data, but that's the sordid record. And you can check that out with others also. This, of course, we are very good at. Pakistanis make babies so well and so rapidly. Yeah? We've left every other major Muslim country far behind. 2.4%. Maybe Niger in Africa, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, is the only one that has probably got a higher birth rate. And Yemen, tortured Yemen. But Turkey, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Iran, everyone has brought it down to less than 2%. We are right up there. Calamities, perpetual. And we have an unmet need. If only 30, 35% of married couples are using contraceptives, surveys have shown that another 30% want to use contraceptives, but they don't have access. They don't know where to go. They are afraid of using family planning methods. <laughs> Unmet need. And then this blessing of exponential growth of information, this unprecedented phenomenal growth in every single field, even a specialist in a particular area of medicine cannot keep pace with what is happening. And I'm not being judgmental. Uh, I am trying to be humble because I think that the speed of information growth is entropy. As you know, entropy is where you actually begin to deteriorate uh, because of the incapacity to handle information growth. And that has brought about this, for the first time in human history, the absorptive capacity of the average individual human being simply cannot keep pace with the information that other human beings are producing. This has never happened before. It has never happened before the 20th century. So we have nothing to go by. We will have to learn how to cope with this. How do, we, how do we halt this terrible decline of attention spans? I walk into the rooms of cabinet ministers, even the chief executives, and he has a television set right there. 
And I often wonder, how is he able to concentrate what you're doing? I mean, your attention is being diverted every few seconds. You want to watch TV and you want to take monumentally important decisions. Momentously important. Oh boy, this is truly a calamity. And then, of course, all of us are on this roller coaster of the market economy, the defeat of communism, the failure of extreme socialism. So, the capitalist road is the only road. Even China adopts it. China retains political communism, wisely, perhaps, unlike the Soviet Union, which simultaneously attempted to dismantle economic communism and political communism and collapsed. China wisely retains the stability, however one may disagree with its single-party authoritarianism, but opens up the floodgates to capitalism. Well, as a result, the finite resources of our planet depleting at uh, huge rates. And everyone wants more of everything. Epitomized by a soft drinks advertising campaign in recent years. Dil mange more. Ay, ay, ay. Kya baat hai. Yeah. I mean, I will reach heaven if I can have one more uh, sip from this uh, soft drink. Uh, that's the definition of uh, the whole creed that we have learned to live by. And children are being indoctrinated every day. All they do is watch television or social media where unless you possess something, unless you buy this and you buy that, you can't be happy. So, collective suicide of a kind, but killing us softly. And then at the same time, this marvel of the structure of the United Nations. For the first time in history, countries agreeing on the law of the sea, on telecommunications, on trade, on air travel. My God, never before witnessed. Hundreds of treaties and agreements. And yet, regional or bilateral, you have totally unpredictable violations by what one can call hegemons. And hegemons is a polite word. What comes to mind is predators, predator states who grab territory, whether it's Israel, which uses its initial 1948 allocation of territory to now be five times larger than what it was, whether it is that small neighbor to the east of us, or whether it is Russia now on the terrible path of violating the territorial sovereignty of another country. And you, you have this existing side by side. Uh, one, an unprecedented achievement of order, coherence, and the General Assembly equity and equality negated by the Security Council. And on the other, completely unjustified action. So, as Dr. Bhutta said, we have had significant improvement whether it be Pakistan, where we don't like to acknowledge it generally. Our life expectancy in 1948 and uh, 47 was less than 50. It is over 65 now. That's a major achievement. There have been other improvements in indicators. And yet, we have, I, I can't even say mashallah, we, we have just four of those I've listed, but there are several more. The diseases of affluence as also the diseases of poverty side by side. So, perhaps this is the last calamity of change, which is, on the one hand, for the first time, people participating politically, conscious of their voting power. And at the same time, particularly in Pakistan, captives of an ossified, non-representative electoral system that makes a mockery out of, you know, the real character of political institutions. 
uh, without compulsory voting, 50% vote. And with our absurd first-past-the-post electoral system, anyone who gets one vote more than five other candidates gets to be the winner. And that winner represents not only the uh, people who voted for him and did not vote for him, he also represents the 50% who never voted at all. Unless we introduce compulsory voting, as is done in 23 countries of the world, uh, we have a system where we stoke grievance, apathy, keep blaming innocent characters like Javed Jabbar for being the corrupt politician, not fulfilling the mandate of the people, instead of uh, the system being able to represent the will of the nation. And good old media. Ah. I call their disease, news media suffer from a disease. It's called, I call it morosia. They, they just don't seem to be able to find anything uh, redeeming or good. Or even if they do, it's confined to far fewer minutes or space than the bad news. Because they suffer from this conviction that only bad news is good news. And then the hysteria and then the enslavement of the media by advertising. And I happen to know a little about it because I come from this other noble profession called advertising. As a result, content in media dumbed down. That was all the good news, by the way. I now come to the bad news, the strategies for change. And I need to keep an eye on the clock. Political, professional, societal. Where do we begin? Very clearly, even though the 18th Amendment was a major landmark in maturity and being able to devolve power away from Islamabad, on the operational level, it has resulted in major anomalies, lack of consistency and coordination between the Federation and the four provinces, and between the provinces, even though we have a council of common interests. And I give you an example that 40 years ago, Pakistan took the dubious step of separating family planning and population welfare from the health department. And for years, we advocated reintegration. As of today, 2022, only Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, to its credit, has actually done it, has begun to integrate uh, their rural health centers and their family planning units. Uh, the Sin government, to its credit, has one minister, Azra Pechuho, for both departments, which is a good, good step. Uh, Punjab hasn't done it yet. So, the first thing has to be this political will to change the structures of governance of health and population welfare. That's vital. Another political... Uh, aspect of change. While it is commendable, you know, the billion tree tsunami, the 10 billion tree tsunami, there is a need to expand the framework, the conceptual approach, to take into account other facets of the environment and our ecology, our sewage systems in particular. Sewage is not a fashionable thing to talk about. The Prime Minister would not like to talk about sewage. Uh, but sewage is the reality of uh, what we are dumping into the Arabian Sea, what we are dumping into the Indus River, which in one cynical estimate is no longer a river, it's a gutter. And you have to sometimes sleep next to the Indus River, as I did years ago in D.I. Khan, to realize what we are sending down the river to the Arabian Sea. Uh, so we need uh, uh, the articulation at the political level that integrates these concerns and talks about all of them. And I wait for the day when not the Minister for Environment, but the Finance Minister. The Finance Minister should get up in Parliament and present a green budget. 
This is what we did to our resources for the past 364 days. This is the state of maternal and health mortality affected by climate change and emissions. And this is where we are headed. And only then, next day, present the finance budget. This excessive focus on the finance budget completely changes uh, the people's perception of what is important of governance about the environment and about <laughs> uh, money. A second professional strategy. While the Pakistan Medical Association, for example, or other specialist bodies are active on some occasions, uh, very respectfully, I don't think they've even begun to uh, take care of more than 10 to 20 percent of the potential that these forums have, where individual doctors and collectively medical specialists who care about health, who, whose profession is about health care and nutrition, uh, and who invite other uh, specializations to also become part of advocacy. And, of course, uh, rich doctors, I'm sure this hall is full of rich doctors, Dr. Zulfikar Bhutta. Oh, students, oh, future rich doctors, huh? <laughs> they need to, and those very small nominal profit-making firms called pharma firms, huh? the colossus, the colossus of the corporate sector, they need to step up and contribute far more funding to these professional associations to enable advocacy. So, I think an enhanced focus by the health sector on preventive care and self-care. I know this is all about curative care. We are in a great hospital, uh, but truly we do very little to use education, to use the curriculum, to use public education to increase the awareness of how they can avoid getting into a hospital. On the societal level, there is a clear need for far greater coordination between NGOs and civil society forums. I give you the example of the PNC, the Pakistan National Committee of the International Union for Conservation of Nature. You mentioned Dr. Abid Suleri. Is he here? Yes, there he is. Well, we are colleagues in the PNC. And that's a fine example of over 30 NGOs across the country cooperating very assiduously on issues of environment and environmental health. Those need to be replicated on a larger scale far more effectively. And this is a bit of a pipe dream, but more space and time in independent and private media and state media to the subject. Uh, to advance public education. Finally, be relieved to know I'm coming to the end, uh, societal, chain behavior, the citizen. Uh, the buck is with us, each of us. And I'm not finger pointing, it starts with me. Uh, we can't always keep looking at others to take the necessary action. The chief minister, the governor, the prime minister, minister of health. In each of our lives, whatever we do, there is so much scope to do more. In those respects that I have had the temerity to mention, consumption, uh, awareness spreading, sharing, strengthening each other. And I think the buck will always stop with us. We have to begin. That's the toughest part. My wife tells me this. How about changing yourself? And of course, she wins the argument every time. But let me end by reminding ourselves that this tormented, beloved country of ours, Pakistan, beset with huge problems, uncertainty, corruption, huh? maladministration, we are capable of excellence. Our country has produced individuals after individuals in a wide range of sectors 
whether it is Professor Abdus Salam, educated in a village school in Punjab, village school, we didn't have electricity. Whether it is the diplomats at the United Nations who went out in the late 40s, early 50s and left an indelible impression of excellence in global diplomacy and even do it today. Malala Yousafzai. Oh, how many names can I take? Individuals, outstanding doctors who've gone out from places like this and go and help the national health care system in, in the UK, in America. Individuals. And the people collectively, the collective generosity and compassion of the people of Pakistan, virtually unrivaled, virtually unrivaled. I remember about 15 years ago, the Khan Foundation did a survey of philanthropy in Pakistan. And while, of course, the rich gave more, give more, it turned out that the poor give more frequently than the rich. Wow, wow, wow. The poor give more frequently than the rich. And every, any foreigner who comes to Pakistan for the first time is blown over because the country's people turn out to be a totally different set of human beings from how the media had prepared him for Pakistan. Memorable compliment was by a German consul general about eight years ago at his farewell party. He said, when I was told you're being posted to Karachi, my family and I said, we don't want to go. He said, three years later, we don't want to leave Karachi. We love Pakistan. We love the people of Karachi. And he wasn't just being a diplomat. He meant it. So, people, with all our warts and our wasps and our distortions, we are capable. And finally, institutions, Pakistani institutions. I, I thought we have very weak institutions. But congratulations, no? We are capable of building institutions. We are sitting in one right now. I'm standing, you're sitting at the Khan University. Yes, it's private sector, but it's an example of the government recognizing the value of this university. Nadra, oh, Nadra. Nadra services have been requested in East Africa, in Southeast Asia. Documentation impeccably done. Millions of citizens. Way before India even began to think of it. The State Bank of Pakistan, when it is not increasing interest rates, <laughs> is a very good, very sound, stable body. The Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission and everyone's favorite, the armed forces of Pakistan, especially when they are not interfering in the political process. <laughs> they are a merit-based institution, merit-based you don't have to be someone's son or daughter or bhatija or niece or uncle to become the general or the chief of army staff or what have you. We have the capacity to create institutions when we want. And lastly, we have a check and balance system. Even though we have this madness of religiosity and people being accused of blasphemy and innocent people being killed by mobs, there has never been a single person executed for a death sentence for blasphemy. In fact, we've had the Supreme Court acquitting Asya Bibi. And we have had the killer of my dear beloved friend Salman Tasir, governor of Punjab. The killer was sent to the gallows, to death. The Supreme Court had the courage to ensure justice. Institutions. The same Supreme Court sent more than one prime minister packing. The same Supreme Court, special court, the same judiciary, declared a former chief of army staff as a usurper. One judge did the unspeakable thing of adding a comment saying his body should be dragged through the streets. I mean, a terrible thing to say. But an institution was free and able to speak out. So, Depends, have hope. And I think 
through this seminar many, many far more useful proposals than whatever few things I've submitted will emerge. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.